So what is Article 13? It's part of the European Copyright Directive that was passed in September of 2018. Essentially, it's designed to update existing copyright laws in Europe, but as you'll see, if it stays as written, it will affect the whole world. So let's look at how copyright works now and how this will change. The way copyright works on the internet today is as follows. Currently, fair use laws allow for the use of copyrighted content. This includes use for criticism, educational use, research and news reporting. If something is uploaded illegally outside of fair use, then it's up to the producers of the copyrighted music or videos to go after whoever's illegally uploading the content. With Article 13, the European version of fair use is largely thrown out the window and even more devastating, and this is the important part, the responsibility of chasing up illegal content will shift onto the major platforms themselves. Briefly put, Article 13 places responsibility on websites such as YouTube, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to make sure that copyrighted material isn't illegally uploaded. If they're found to be hosting such content, they'll be slapped with a fine for every instance of this happening, and this results in massive unintended consequences. All websites that allow user uploaded content aren't going to want to take the risk of being sued under Article 13. They're going to only allow content that they can be 100% sure isn't going to result in them getting sued. The chances are, regular user uploaded content isn't going to make the cut, and only the biggest companies will be guaranteed to upload legally under Article 13. So I understand that copyright protection is important, but the way it is stated in Article 13 is very poorly defined. An earlier version of the law stated that there should be a use of, quote, proportionate content recognition technologies, end quote. This would be similar to YouTube's current AI copyright recognition, and if the law stayed that way, that would be okay. But in the new version of the proposal that was passed in September, vested interests lobbied to make the language increasingly vague. Now it reads that companies have to, quote, cooperate in good faith when dealing with copyrighted content. The EU's definition of good faith could mean anything. For example, all content that could be interpreted as copyrighted material might not be used in good faith. This is just setting the system up prime for abuse. Every frame of video, every drawing, every sound, every photo will be under heavy scrutiny. Even simple things as small as logos are all copyrighted material and they're not going to be allowed. Such a broad definition ends up making the law potentially extremely strict. YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki stated that Article 13, quote, poses a threat to creators' livelihoods and all of our ability to upload videos to share our voices with the world. The proposal could force platforms like YouTube to allow only content from a small, large number of companies. It will be too risky for platforms to host content from smaller original content creators because the platforms will now be directly liable for that content, end quote. When different countries have different laws, companies usually cater to the least common denominator. Rather than having different policies for users in different countries, companies will just usually target the strictest set of rules and comply with those, then apply that set of rules to everybody. For a recent example of this, earlier this year, you probably got a flood of emails from Facebook, Google, Reddit, and pretty much every website under the sun notifying you, hey, we've updated our privacy policy, click that you accept it. Well, the fact that you got all these emails around the same time wasn't a coincidence. All all of these companies were updating their privacy policy to comply with GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation passed in May by, you guessed it, the European Union. These sorts of privacy and copyright changes affect all users. I'm talking about Alex Jones. He is the founder of InfoWars and he is now feeling the heat himself. YouTube, Facebook and Apple all announcing they're removing his content from their platforms. Here's how YouTube explain its decision. Quote, when users violate policies repeatedly, like our policies against hate speech and harassment or our terms prohibiting circumvention of our enforcement measures, we terminate their accounts. One of the most popular alternative news channels, Infowars, has seen a major crackdown. Facebook, YouTube, Apple and Spotify are all blocking its accounts and taking down its content, though it all happened on the very same day. Facebook explains the ban as follows. We have taken it down for glorifying violence and using dehumanizing language to describe people who are transgender, Muslims and immigrants, which violates our hate speech policies. Infowars was launched by Alex Jones in the late 90s. His YouTube videos have been watched more than 1.6 billion times, which is comparable to many popular Western media outlets on the platform. 
Many have deemed him a peddler of conspiracies. In a 2015 interview to his channel, Donald Trump praised his work, though people on social media have certainly clashed over the ban. Whether or not you agree with Alex Jones, I would be just the same amount of adamant that I think it's bad policy to ban people no matter what. I mean, really no matter what. I mean, in the United States, we have a concept of free speech that we love very much. It means a lot to us. Now, these are private companies. They can do what they want to do. I'm not saying they shouldn't be able to do this, and I'm certainly not saying that government should regulate whether or not private companies can make decisions like this. But I am saying I think it's a bad decision, and I think that in the long run, it will not pay off for these companies. It is an extremely slippery slope. I do believe, ultimately, that probably some conservative entity will come up with competitive uh, platforms for the ones that are doing the banning and, and the censoring, um, and ultimately they will have stiff competition that may even relegate them to, uh, you know, relative obscurity because of things like this, especially if they remain so one-sided. It's truly an honor and a privilege as ADL CEO for me to prevent Tim Cook with ADL's first Courage Against Hate Award. At Apple, we believe that technology needs to have a clear point of view on this challenge. There is no time to get tied up in knots. That's why we only have one message for those who seek to push hate, division, and violence. You have no place on our platforms. A new website has developed a search engine specifically to expose which apps have been blocked by Apple's App Store in China. According to a report by The Intercept, AppleCensorship.com is a website that monitors censorship in over 150 iOS app stores. The website was created by a Chinese nonprofit organization called GreatFire.org. This organization is dedicated to monitoring China's internet censorship and creating tools to fight against it. They have developed apps like Free Browser and Free Books, which lets users access uncensored books and news in China along with other websites promoting freedom of speech. Their newest website comes as a response to Apple's collaboration with China. In 2017, the tech giant removed more than 600 virtual private network apps that allow users to browse the web without being under the eye of Big Brother. In an interview with The Intercept, GreatFire.org co-founder Charlie Smith said that the top 100 VPN apps in the U.S. App Store are all not available in the China App Store. Not surprising. Currently, Apple has also blocked apps from media outlets including The New York Times, Tibetan News and Voice of Tibet. They have also blocked Bitter Winter, an application that shares news about religious freedom in China and another app managed by the Central Tibetan Authority. Smith also commented on Apple's role in censorship in China, stating, Apple provides little transparency into what it censors in its app store. Most developers find out their app has been censored after they see a drop in China traffic and try to figure out if there's a problem. We wanted to bring transparency to what they are censoring. Perhaps most importantly, it drives us not to be bystanders, bystanders as hate tries to make its headquarters in the digital world. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. And as we showed this year, we won't give a platform to violent conspiracy theorists on the App Store. Our morality, our own innate desire to separate right from wrong, choosing to set that responsibility aside at a moment of trial is a sin is a sin. Some iPhone owners say they want Apple to pay for slowing down older phones. The tech giant is facing multiple lawsuits after it admitted that it slows down older models. Well, this comes as analysts say fewer people than expected asked for a new iPhone 10 under the tree this Christmas. CNN Samuel Burke joins us live for more. So let's just start here with what's going on with these older iPhones. Why is Apple slowing them down? 
Good morning, Pamela. CNN Money now counts five different class action lawsuits. Basically, iPhone, uh, Apple rather, finally came forward and said what many people had suspected for a long time, that when you update to the newest versions of iOS on the following phones, let me just list them for you so you can see if your phone is one of the ones that's affected, the iPhone 6, 6S, SE, and iPhone 7, that they slow your usage down. But Apple says it's not for the reason that many are accusing them of. They say it's because there's actually an issue with the battery in these phones. After a lot of usage, the battery can surge and that causes the phone to shut down, a problem that many of us have had. So what they say they're trying to do is slow the phone down so those surges don't happen and your phone doesn't shut down all of a sudden. So if you have an older iPhone, what can you do to avoid the slowdown? Is there anything? Well, this is what's so difficult, Pamela, because on the one hand, people say, well, I can just uh, not update to the latest version of iOS. But as CNN's technology correspondent, I would not advise that because there are a lot of security patches that come with these updates. So you're stuck between a slow phone and a phone that turns off. Some experts say that maybe a new battery could help, but that's $80 at the Apple store. And even Apple's not saying clearly whether that will help or not. And I think that's why so many people feel that this mm. lack of transparency from Apple has put a lot of people between a rock and a hard place, an iPhone and another iPhone.